Go where your best prayers take you, unclench the fists of your spirit and take it easy. Breathe deeply of the glad air and live one day at a time. Know that you are precious and learn to trust. Amen. Well, good morning to everyone. Now, you have to sing these last two stanzas of 550 with exuberance because Rick lets me sing this text once a year, and I love this hymn. It's written by Cecil Alexander, who wrote um, uh, Once in Royal David's City and Brightest and Best. He wrote some great texts, and it's just read it. Read the text. It's wonderful. In fact, we'll sing the old Christian. There's an old Christian tune, all you Baptists know, that goes has a little more lilt to it. Maybe that's what we need, but... I love the text about Jesus calling us. This week I had the great privilege to be with a group of folks from St. John's and one parishioner from um, St. Elizabeth's and Farragut and traveled to New York City and spend a week at the Freedom School at St. Anne's where we partner in mission and ministry with them. I mean, it's a great week, it's a hot week like it was here, really hot. Um, one of the, some of the people in our group had not done really much sightseeing in New York, so we had to do that great pilgrimage that everybody does. We went to Times Square at 7.30 in the evening. I am not over it yet. <laughs> it is unbelievable. 30 stories tall of mirrors, glass, um, lights, 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 and 360 degree lights, 360 degrees of selling, 360 degrees of shops and people. It's unbelievable. It's packed. And it was 98 degrees or something. It's insane. And I want those of you who have been there before to be, um, have a little hope for New York. The naked cowboy now wears whitey tighties. So things are improving. <laughs> Who the naked cowboy? Anyway. It, it really makes you think that kind of everything, and I mean everything is for sale in New York. I'll let your imagination go where that takes you. Um, but it got me to thinking about, you know, how much commerce is part of us, literally. How much sales is part of us, literally. How much we are being sold something all the time, all day long. It really is part of America. And I was standing there thinking about it in the midst of all this kind of craziness and pandemonium. So I want to tell you then the worst sales pitch that I know of happened at Duke University. So I want to set the scene so you're with me a bit. Um, this woman was coming to campus. Students heard about her. And about 300 students showed up to one of their small auditoriums. Place was packed. She walked up to the front, had a simple podium, microphone, no music, no slides, no technology, no PowerPoint. What was she thinking? She walks up. She waited, in fact. She waited for them to get quiet. She stood there until everybody got quiet. She said, well, I don't really know why I'm here at Duke. She said, it is a first-class university. But, you know, it's kind of a BMW school. Most of you kids are rich. And, you know, you're kind of well off, if not. But you are bright and ambitious. I know that. And many of you, if not most of you, will have no problem getting a job in Wall, on Wall Street, going on to schools of whatever choice, work in the government. So I'm here for another reason. I'm here to convince you to throw away the best years of your life with me and with us. Yes, your early 20s. Being sent to some of the worst neighborhoods in the United States. That's what I'm here to ask you to do. In fact, two of our workers have been killed in the line of duty. And for that privilege, we will pay you $20,000 a year for the next few years. Now, I know now, right now, that most of you have quit listening, so I'm going to quit talking. So thanks for coming. If by chance you might think you are up to the challenge of being part of Teach for America, I've got brochures up front, and I'm making appointments. And thanks again for listening. The meeting's over. Dead, quiet, nobody moving. <laughs> and in about 30 seconds, 200 students leapt to their feet as if one group and raced to the front, knocking each other over to get in line. And everywhere she goes, she has the same response. 
who was it? One of you said something about worrying about our youth. Maybe you can quit worrying. Teach for America, just they have all the people they need. Can't push them away. What was it? What in the world was she selling that got that kind of response and gets that kind of response? Hmm. You know, I read some interesting statistics last week. They kind of go like this. The average American, you average, I don't know, but try this. The average American spends three years in meetings at work of your lifetime. Some of you probably feel like you spend about 75 years of your lifetime in meetings. The average American will spend 13 years of his or her life watching television. The average American will make 2,000 trips to McDonald's. And those of you with four or five kids, you're going to make 6,000 trips to McDonald's. The average American will have six major car accidents. The average American male will spend eight days or eight trips to the hospital of something more than passing. And for women, it is 12. The average American spends 24 years sleeping. And finally, the average American spends six months sitting at traffic lights. And if you're in downtown Knoxville, that's a year. (laughs) What was it that the woman for Teach for America was selling? Do you know? That you do. She was selling to those young people that, that thing about having life make a difference and be different. Every one of us wants more than just to get by. Not one of you wants to just get by. Oh, you may have days that getting by is okay, but that's not true. You don't want that. Nobody wants that. And that's that's worth buying. Let me tell you, it's worth trying to get. We want to make a difference. We want our lives to make a difference. We want our lives to matter. And yes, we even want the daily tasks of living to matter. And that is extremely hard to do because we've got so many of them. I saw an interview on television recently. Some of you may have seen. It was with a woman who had raised 12 children. And it was one of those pieces at the end of kind of the news hour where they're doing kind of heroic figures. And they picked an ordinary woman. And her heroism had been to raise 12 children. Only one of them was biological. It was her first. She had a biological child. And she realized when her husband left, she had some time, she thought, I'm going to take in another child. So she took in a foster child. She did it 11 times and adopted all of those 11 with her own. And she did, raised every one of those children by herself. The reporter was asking her, you know, how in the world did you do that? You know, you kind of have a modest income. How did you raise all those kids? And she started talking about what you do when you have that, those, that many children. The older ones have to learn to take care of the younger ones. They have to help them with their homework. Everybody has to have a job in the house. Actually, I wanted her to come range my life. I mean, it sounded great. I mean, you have to have a pattern. Things have to go. Everybody has to be on the same page or try to be on the same page. You have to work together. It really actually was wonderful to listen to. But when she got, then the reporter really asked her the real question. Why did you do that? And she stopped. She didn't have an easy answer. And then she said, my faith. My faith let me see a new world. My faith let me see a new world. Isn't it interesting when we have that kind of eyesight, which I think is called vision, we can see something new. We see something that's possible. We see something grand that may not be easy, but that matters. And when we see that, our lives will be different. Automatically, your life, my life, is different with a new vision. And our lives then do matter because our lives begin to make a difference. And so that daily life and daily activities 
matter within that making a difference as well. You see, it doesn't take an heroic act. You don't have to go sign up to live in some tough neighborhood or live out of the country. But we do need to see things differently. We do need a vision. Much like the vision that we have painted for us this morning from St. Paul. Did you get it? He began to see his life differently. And notice it goes in stages. If you've studied St. Paul, it doesn't come all at once. Notice where he moves in this passage for us today. He begins to say, I, Paul, was a servant of the gospel. How many of you make that claim? How many of you make that claim? You know what I talk about all the time? What I believe. Do you catch it? He has moved himself from this believing stuff to something deeper, to being a servant of what he believes, to put it into practice. And then those of you who have studied Paul, what does he go, where does he go next? He takes that servant word and makes it tougher. He says, I became a slave of the gospel for the gospel. And later in his writings, he will make it even stronger. I have become a prisoner of the gospel for Jesus Christ, he says. It didn't happen at once, but it grew, and it grew in him. So what is St. Paul trying to sell us today? Well, I'll tell you one thing. He's not trying to sell us the sweet by and by of this cute, wonderful, sweet religion that makes you feel good and makes everybody happy. He's not selling you what some are selling you, that if you come and spend your time at the church, when you get home, there's going to be a new Cadillac in your driveway. That is not what he's selling you. But he is selling. He is selling. I want to tell you about something that I witnessed this week that has stayed with me and probably will stay with me for a long time. It kind of bowled me over. And it was one of those small little incidents he just walked by unless you happen to see it. The kids in the Freedom School at St. Anne's come from that neighborhood. They are at 139th Street and St. Anne's Boulevard in, um, in the Bronx. They are in the poorest neighborhood congressional district in the United States. The poorest congressional district in the United States. So on Fridays, they take these children, there are about 90 of them, and they go somewhere, hair-raising to me, they got them on the subway. Try that. 100 kids on a subway at once. Oh, my gracious. But anyway, they take them places in the city. And let me tell you, most of these kids don't even know what's four blocks from their house. They've never been anywhere. So they take them to the zoo. They take them to the museums. They take them to the parks. Well, on this Friday, we went to see the Mo Math. I love it. Mo, M-O. Mo Math Museum at 26th then 5th. Fabulous. And they've got the cutest, brightest young people in there um, leading and guiding and teaching. Um, our guide was a math graduate from MIT. Anyway, um, you, get the, you get the point. Just great young people are in this place. So we get, the kids are all lined up. We've we got to get them in line. You know, we've got to get everybody sorted and sorting 100 kids. Not easy. We have finally get everybody in the door. We get all the badges. Everybody's got a badge. Make sure everybody's sorted out so we don't lose anybody in the museum. And, and we've had this one little boy, Jose, my wife Lois had been with him and others. Um, he just really had a hard time for the last couple of weeks of Freedom School. In fact, they'd probably sent him home at least once, and he was barely making it. He just acted out. He was a pain. He was a pain to me. He was a pain to lots of people. Sweet boy, but he was just trying everybody's patience, and he was just, you know, adversarial. And so you can imagine, there we are in line, and boom, he starts. Because we've got these big bags, and we have to go down, and everybody's got to put their backpack in it, and everybody has to put their lunch in it, so we'll get them back out later. So he's on his lunch. Uh-uh, he's not giving his lunch. So we ask politely. Mm -mm. Then we ask not politely. Mm -mm. Nope, digging in, right in the middle of the museum. And at about that time when the young high school volunteers just walked right up and, boom, interceded between the adults and Jose. And she leaned over, and she said, Jose, what's going on? We need your lunch. No. She said, wait a minute. So she went and found his little sister. I was a little sister back. She had a lunchbox. She said, oh, Jose, now, sweetie, I want you to put your lunch in here. We're going to put it in the lunchbox. He sits in the red bag, and we're going to put it in the red bag, and you're going to get it back at lunchtime, okay? He said, okay. 
I go through the mechanics, and instantly, he's perfectly fine. I'm looking at this kid going, where does she come from? <laughs> what is going on? Well, guess what? She knew his story. Jose has two siblings, two sister siblings that are younger than he. Both his parents are drug addicts. He's homeless. The reason he didn't want to give his lunch is he might not get another one. And she knew it. She spoke to him kindly, gently, with real care, real care, down at his level, real love, real simple love, nothing big. You know, Paul is selling us something today, whether you're aware of it or not. He is trying to sell us something pretty powerful, actually. He's trying to sell us a little bit of heaven, heaven on earth. The great Episcopal priest, Dr. Sam Shoemaker, said something one time that is so worth hearing, I really want you to hear what he said. He said, in the triangle of love that exists between me and God and other people is found the secret of existence and the foretaste of heaven. In the triangle of love between me and God and the people around me is the secret of existence and a foretaste of heaven. So today, move a little bit from believing to serving. Move yourself just a little, just a little. Do a little service. You don't have to look. All the opportunities will be right there for you. Now and in a few minutes when you leave here. I promise you. Take that little step. You may need a little vision to see it, so keep awake. Keep watching. And then serve. Just serve. And then step into heaven. And tell me what it tastes like. Amen.